This is the Well Brewed Podcast, where we share our 40 plus years of commercial brewing experience to help fellow beer lovers on their journey of building a brewery. Full disclosure, we own a brewery equipment business, but we aren't here to sell you anything. This is truly about helping the industry we love. Industry. Sorry about that, everyone. G'day. Welcome <laughs> to episode six, the Well Brewed Podcast. Uh, my name's Lockie, and I'm here with my mate Jake, drinking fresh local beer and chatting about building breweries. In today's episode, we're diving into sizing brewing equipment. But first, Jake, what are we drinking? We've got this lovely Sanctus Spooks Ember Ale. Ember Ale. It must be like ember, smoky. Man. Yeah, maybe they put some shards of charred oak in it. Who knows? Let's find out. That's right. Um, it's Irish red, hopped up Irish red. Um, I actually got this. I was down in Whoopi, down in Whoop Whoop. Last week, brewing with Charlie at the brewery down there and uh, had uh, got this from oh, the local bottler. So thanks, to, uh, Sanctus. Yeah, so the Clarence Valley, hey? Good oysters there. Good oysters. We were just talking about that before. Um, yeah, we need some. Why is it, what, are they brewing an oyster stout? That's what I want to know. Is yeah, they need to, they need to get onto that. Oh, the problem is the oysters are very expensive. They're in high demand. Right. Well, well, they also have expensive. a lot of good access to sardines down that way. Mm, we had sardines yeah. at the pub down there, didn't we? Down yeah, the way. sardines. Uh, oh, yeah, we did when we were going to Grafton. Yeah. Yeah, that they were good. delicious. Yeah, yeah, amber sardines are famous in Australia. Are they? There you yeah. go. I love sardines. I eat um, King Oscar straight from the tin. Yeah, good for your pelt. Yeah, <laughs> it's good for your coat. It keeps it shiny, mate. Um, this beer's good. I'm actually pumped that we're drinking something that's not a pale ale for like the first time ever on the potty. No, we had is, that uh... sour. Oh, we did actually. We had Dave's sour. That was good. I think every other one's been a hoppy pale ale. Mm. Um, it's good to have something malty. So, yeah, this yeah. is really nice. Sorry, Clemmy, you missed out. Mm. We should, um, I guess, kick off into what we're going to be discussing today. Yes, so sizing equipment. I mean, I guess there's heaps of factors and heaps of variables that need to come into consideration, but I think we'll just try and review them as best we can, get together some sort of concise ruling or criteria on it, and then, um, yeah, hopefully there's something usable in it for anyone who's putting together a brewery. So I thought maybe we'd just kick off with heating source. Um, There's probably three main ones that um, you can deal with electric, electrics, electric elements, uh, direct fired, which is like gas burners into a chamber, or steam, <clears throat> steam breweries yep. with a boiler. So why don't we start with electric? Jake, you're the engineer. So pros and yep. cons of electric, what's good and bad? So electric is, well, it's the most efficient. So yeah, and it, electricity goes through the, the um, elements causes resistance that resistance gets transferred into heat energy that heat then 100 percent of that heat unless you forget to put water in the tank before you turn the element on <laughs> um gets converted into heat like heat for your beer there's no losses it's actually interesting your comment about the 100 percent efficiency because something i learned that from you not too long ago and i was surprised because electric breweries actually have a bad rap typically but I think yeah. from a, you know, if you've got good access to green electricity and um, they're actually probably not as bad uh, from perspective and cost efficiency as, as they get a wrap for. Yeah, I think the draw, the main drawback for me with electric is the it's, it's a couple of things. There's a hygiene issue because elements are hard to clean. They've got lots of nooks and crannies. They've got lots of um, just wells that don't get cleaned properly. They also tend to break quite a fair bit. They wear out. Like their resistor, you're putting a lot of current through that resistor to generate the heat, and eventually it fails uh, because of the high temperature that it goes to. They've got to be made out of, alloys that give them the special properties that they need but also means that they're weaker to chemical um attack than stainless steel so they tend to you know not last as long in the cleaning cycles 
Yeah, but they um, need more cleaning too, right? Because they get such a high temperature on the surface, and they get all that marring and uh, yes, protein. Yes, and then that, that's the last point would be the temperature gradient that yes. you have between the wort and the element. If you don't have good mixing, uh, like which you can't do in a mash, for example, yeah, because uh, it's too viscous, uh, they're almost useless. So it would be that they're not really applicable to mash tuns at all. No. You wouldn't would never really see them in a mash tun. You'd only use them in a hot liquor or a kettle, and you've yeah. got a higher uh, delta T, right, which is the temperature differential from your heating surface, which means now you're the scientist and I'm the hack brewer, but my understanding is that you're getting um, like more trans-2 nonanol formation yep. um, because of the high temperature, which means you're going to have more papery flavour, a lot lower product stability flavor stability long term yes yes and not only that you can have um more of the maillard reaction happening which can yep. change the color of your beer as well and flavor and flavor yeah get more yep. caramelized flavor so yeah um from a certain point of view they are efficient from another point of view they're not conducive to making great quality beer so I, I, I generally don't like to see them other than in a hot liquor tank or a boiler feed water tank or in a keg cleaner. Right. And so application for electric in a brew house, preferable if if it had to be, would probably just be a hot liquor tank. Yeah. Um, but you, I, I guess I know my point is that you probably, you still can, not probably, you can make good beer on electric systems if it's a constraint of your site, but the um, you have lower flavor stability long term, higher maintenance costs, and uh, higher cleaning labor and chemical costs. It's all, it's more it's more like higher unpredicted maintenance costs. Like you never mm-hmm. really know when your element's about to go, mm-hmm. which can cause loss of production, which makes it less stable. But obviously, it right. costs more to maintain a boiler. Because it's yes. an ongoing legislated cost. Yes. But it's also routine maintenance that's scheduled that you know is happening. And you, if it's done to the T how it's meant to be done, then often you don't have it break down. Sure. Okay. All right. So it's a good summary electric. What about gas fired, direct fired kits? They're definitely not my favorite. <laughs> yeah. they, are, they are good. They, What's good they, about them? Let's start so, with good things. Let's start with the good things, yeah. Um, good is you can do stepped infusion. Um, yes, so you can have them on a mash tun. You can have them on a mash tun as long Which, as you've got decent agitation in that mash tun so that you're not getting anything burnt to the bottom. Again, though, it's a higher temperature differential between heating oh, surface. Yeah. You've got a piece of steel probably about four or five mil thick um with a thousand degrees plus on one side and you know 50 or well, 60 degrees on the other side yes so, so massive def- difference in temperature so you've got to make sure that agitation is really important because you're just going to completely ruin your enzymes yeah denature your enzymes if you're uh um not stirring well on that heated surface you've also got yep. um a lot of latent heat in the base of the chambers. Mm-hmm. So those chambers are made out of a lot of uh, ceramic bricks and mm-hmm. are encased in steel and the bricks are quite thick. Mm-hmm. They carry a lot of heat when they're, when they're hot. And when you turn off the flame, doesn't mean it's going to like stop heating up because you've still got to transfer all that energy out of that chamber <clears throat> so that it yes. can reach ambient again. And normally that just keeps going into your beer so that unless you have really good control and you've taken note of your latent heat potential mm-hmm. uh, and turn the burner off early, mm-hmm. it can do some funny things to beers when you're yeah. trying to do stepped infusion. Yeah, overshoot. Yeah. Mash temperatures, overshoot, mash out, etc. Um, Okay, what other positives have we got? We've got that you can use it for step step mashing. A uh, big positive, I guess, is cost. Yep. Um, the lower capex. Lower capex. You've, they're cheap. You only need to pay for the burner, and you the the 
cost of your tank increases uh, slightly to account yep. for the burn chamber. Um, but overall, it's less. It's way less expensive than steam, conventional yes. steam. Yep, and uses significantly less electricity, mm. obviously, than the electric elements. So yeah. I think something that we see a lot in Australia is restrictions of um, power availability on sites. So if you're at a site that's only got 80 or 100 amps and you're running a brewery in a tap room and a cool room and et cetera, then you're probably going to be struggling to be able to run a full, like a reasonable size brew house on electric as well, right? Yes. And that, that, that's what, yeah, that's another drawback from uh, electric, I guess, is that if you need an extra 20 to 30 amps to power your electric system and you only have 80 amps full up, you're not going to do yourself any favours and you might be up for a, a significant electrics upgrade. Yes, Could which is... you in the realm of like fifty to $60,000. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, and so direct fired kits, other than that, um, so you can use them on a mash tun, so you can have, uh, you know, step in your mash. Obviously, kettle is fine. What are the yep. pros and cons on a kettle? Obviously, the, it's cheaper to build yeah. those kits, but it's... from an operational perspective... You've also got... Uh, you only need to maintain those burners once every six months just mm -hmm. to get somebody to come in and check that they're operating how they should be. Mm -hmm. So there's like relatively low uh, maintenance costs. Yeah, if you've got decent burners, obviously, yeah, there's yeah. no real... I think most yeah. people in Australia would be repping some sort of Italian burner mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because most people won't supply anything else. Yes, there was no <laughs> point cheaping out on there. Reasonably cheap anyway. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's the burn, uh, burner maintenance. But then there's for in the kettle. Obviously, you've got a slightly higher delta T. Is again similar yeah. to the electrics. Much yeah. more surface area on that delta T though than um, with an electric burner because you're heating the entire base of the tank. Yep. Uh, which can lead to scorching and, and stuff if it's mismanaged. You also have very, very limited efficiency with these burners, and often uh, you'll see flu temperatures of four or 500 degrees, which means you're probably only getting somewhere around 50 to 60% um, yep. out of the energy that you put in. Yeah, okay. And the other point I had was about just thermal stress on equipment. You've got really high oh, temperatures yeah. um, through even a hot liquor. You know, they're fine for hot liquor tanks, um, direct fired, because it doesn't really matter how you heat your water. It's hot or it's not. You know, they're fine to any water, but, Yeah, <laughs> um, if you're running them correctly, the, right? Yeah, one of the problems that I've seen in industry is people not staying on top of their water chemistry. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, are you familiar with uh, creep and stress corrosion cool. cracking? I'm familiar with stress corrosion cracking. Creep is, creep is more, was, my, was my nickname at high school. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> kidding. Um, so creep is the <laughs> mechanism of failure that stress corrosion cracking tends to lead to. Right. So okay. it'll all be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And then all of a sudden your tank just goes goes limp right and gives away yes. so it, it, it creeps 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 and then gives away with a with a large failure um yeah those sorts of things are more prevalent in industry than i think people understand and it's due to having chlorides present in your water that are unaccounted for um yep and that leads to intergranular corrosion on the actual surface of the metal on right. the on the lining of the tank. And so you won't, you may not see it because how often do you get up and check inside your hot liquor tank? When you were talking science just then, your comments were similar to the top of my headphones. So going right over the top of my head. <laughs> but um, I'm sure someone will get something from that. I appreciate it. Yeah. 
Uh, I can go into it further to put more clarity if you think people get in. No, out. no, that's fine. If anyone's interested, well, they can reach the out. Chromium leeches out. No, no, I don't think we need a lecture on metal composition and all whatever right, all right. you mastered in. But um, if anyone's got any questions, maybe they can email podcast yeah, yeah, at sure. Wellbrute. They can ask Jay. Your loss, your loss. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Next time, mate. Okay, so, I mean, I guess roundup of direct fired would be that it's um, cost effective, not as efficient, um, a higher stress on your equipment. I think it's cost um, effective in the short term. I've seen a lot of people have yes. to replace their hot liquor uh, tank and their kettle. Yes. Regularly, like every few, every three years because three to five years because it's... It just buckles and starts to break. It's just hard yak on your equipment. It is, it's also yeah. um, like because uh, it's less efficient, you've got higher operating costs, right? Yes. So it's cheaper to start up but not as cheap to run necessarily. Yes. C- as compared to steam um, particularly. Okay. Well, so steam then. It's the, it's the golden goose. It's, it's the golden, the golden egg goose. I love that it. That everyone wants. So um, I guess... The main difference between steam and direct fire is that you're getting your heating via what's called the heat of vaporization, which is the mm-hmm. energy it takes to convert. Uh, it takes a certain unit of energy per kilogram to heat or to convert water from a liquid to a gas. Mm-hmm. That energy is then given up when the steam converts back from a gas to a liquid. It's called the heat of vaporization. It's- Right, which is the phase change, right? Which is the phase change. So that is massive. That's orders of magnitude different than just blasting um, heat at it. So to achieve the same sort of heating, you need just a fraction of the steam. So Which is why what steam would be at 120C, 120 Celsius? Yeah, so it's relative to the pressure. So if you're running your um, system at 2 bar, you'll be somewhere around... 120 degrees, which is what most people should be running at. Yeah, one and a half to two bar. A lot of people have the misconception that you turn up the pressure, you'll have better steam, but it's probably more likely that you've either missized your boiler yeah, um, or you've uh, you just got it, got it running too hot. <laughs> just, right, okay. You're just draining your more gas out of your boiler for nothing. More steam out of yeah, your boiler and for nothing. Pressurized, high pressurized steam jackets is not ideal. You know, you, they're, they're not normally rated to more than what you uh, are putting into them. So, um, I guess uh, so. Steam is great from like low temperature, so low temperature differential between the heating surface. Um, what about efficiency wise versus direct fired? It's more efficient versus electric. It's less. Yeah, so not all not all boilers are created equally. Um, if you're going to get a boiler, you want to make sure that it has as many passes of the flue gas as possible before it exits the system. The beauty of having so, just to put it into perspective, uh, most direct fire kits they'll have a burn chamber at the base. They might have some baffles. Um, so the flue gas will go into the burn chamber, go around the baffles, and then out the flue. That's one pass. This is direct fire, Direct right? fire kit. So a boiler yep. has typically a furnace um, with the burner going straight down the middle, then mm-hmm. rings of concentric tubes around that, and mm-hmm. the flue gas is directed down and around and down and out. So the the, the yep. more passes you have, the more chance it has to give up its energy and yep. heat the tubes. Uh, so there's so there's that, uh, and then there's also um, economizers and other things that can be brought into the mix to try and really get that efficiency up. But it's right. a specific piece of equipment that's designed specifically to capture as much energy as, as it can from burning something. Right. So the, yes. the typical okay. flu temperatures there are around like, you know, 100 to 200 degrees coming out the flu, which is mm-hmm. considerably less than the 400 to 600 degrees I see coming out of most direct fire kits. Yes. 
Um, okay. So we're looking around that like 80% efficiency, 80 to okay. 90. Uh, and you can do Which other things good. to make it more efficient, like, you know, put electric heating on your feed water tank, mm-hmm. capture all your condensate, return that to the feed water tank so that what you're feeding your boiler with is 90 degree water that's just come from the brew house. Yes. Um, so, okay. So the efficiency and so what about there like is not really, it's not proportional to. Yeah. The and it's not, a, it's not just a number either. No. Um, what about like beer quality? Obviously, steam is number one. It's the bee's knees. You've got maximum yeah. amount of control because you're operating at a low delta T. You've got yeah, uh, low latent heat. You've got angle seat valves that just stop the flow of gas so because it's coming from uh, the conversion between the change of state. Then yes. it just stops. You stop putting steam in. You stop getting heat yes. transferred across. And then there's just a tiny bit of latent heat on the surface of the steel in your vessel, yeah. which you can account for, which might be half to one degree. Yeah. Um, okay. And then for work, bo- so great for mashing. Yep. Uh, great for work boiling. Again, low delta T, lower trans two not an oil formation. I guess the other perk of steam is uh, keg cleaning. Yes. 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 A, a thousand times. Yes. Like you're able to sanitize your kegs without putting them uh, with any oxidative chemicals to kill whatever's living inside your kegs after sourdough. And also, like, steam penetrates every nook and cranny. Like, the sanitizers you use on a keg washer, paracetic acid, for Just example. On the outside. Is it, it's a contact steller, sterilant, right? So it needs to touch every surface for 15 minutes in order to be sanitizing that surface. Contact sanitizer, sorry. And so, but steam gets so hot and it penetrates every seal and crack in a seal and nook and cranny in the whole keg and the thread and then it all gets stinking hot. You know, you'll hold it at, 100, at two bars, so 120 degrees. It's just nuking everything. Yeah. It's the only surefire way to ensure that you've got super clean kegs that you can rely on. Yeah. And that really, yep. um, you know, icing on the cake <laughs> yeah it is it's a cherry on <laughs> not only is it better on the brewing practices and more efficient but it's also right makes your cakes yeah. nice and clean <laughs> so heating for breweries i think um most cost effective would be uh depends on your size fired. it depends on your size as well right if okay. it's a five hex so, most cost effective would probably be go electric okay so that's just paint a broad stroke on this and let's say that steam is typically more expensive than direct fired and electric yeah direct fired and electric typically have um higher maintenance costs and produce beer that is of slightly lower quality or lower long-term stability but you there is circumstances where that's acceptable particularly if you've got a brew pub that's just making beer for your own venue you store it cold you sell it quick it's nothing's over a certain amount of old certain amount of weeks old yep. in that you probably can um not realize any of those negatives yeah, except maybe high it. running costs yeah. you won't see it right because it just you don't have time for any of those negative flavor attributes to rear their no, it's only ugly when you start going head quite large distribution models yes Okay, so but steam is preferable if you can afford it to start up. Yeah, and I mean, there's like even other things that we probably haven't even touched on, but there's electric steam boilers <laughs> where they just have the elements yes. and use it to generate steam. And if you've only got a yeah. five heck kit, or even potentially if you've got a lot of electrics and a lot of solar with a ten heck kit, you could probably get away with it. So if- yeah, so electric steam boilers again are you know, a hybrid, which gives you the benefits of steam and the benefits of electric some yeah. in some you Downsize your electrics by just putting your, having hot, oh, there's so many things we can do. We can talk about that for ages. Yeah. <laughs> probably just okay. The other, I guess there is other heating sources, right, that we probably don't need to deep solar dive in. Solar like, <laughs> Yeah, solar heat pumps, glycol boilers, Oof, um, superheated <laughs> hot water. Yeah. yeah, it's all scary stuff. I think the main three we've covered yeah. and, there is other options, but they're not well supported and there's not great solutions, which is why <clears throat> there's a reason that all the big breweries in the world use steam. Yeah, that's that's yeah. 
That's, that pretty well sums it up. Yeah, okay, <laughs> cool. All right, why don't we rock on to brew house configurations? Yeah. Um, so I guess 2v, two, 3v, two, 4v. Yep. Uh, if you don't know what that means, 2-vessel, 3-vessel, and 4-vessel. Um, why don't we just start with 2-vessel and the different configurations you could have with that and the pros and cons of each? Yep. I think we'll keep things simple with 2-vessel because there's only really two main configurations, yep. right? So we go to mash. Yep. Rather two that we would recommend. Yeah, mash kettle. Um, whirlpool and, yep. um, and a mash lauder with a separate kettle whirlpool. So, so the configurations would be there'd be two vessels. Vessel one would be mash kettle whirlpool, which would be one heated vessel, which does all of that, and then a separate lauder ton where you would mash into this vessel, transfer to lauder, where you could do step mashing, transfer to lauder, and then run back into the same vessel for boiling mm -hmm. and whirlpooling. And the other configuration would be uh mash lauder with no heating and then a separate kettle whirlpool mm. that and so so what's the good of mash kettle whirlpool what's the positive so, that if your business model is based around doing only like one brew a day like say so you're the yes. brewer you're the owner you you don't want to be doing 14 hour days you're just going to do one brew a day and you're going to pour your heart and soul into it and you want to have step yep. infusion and flexibility to do whatever the heck take, tickles your fancy. Mm -hmm. That's the brew house configuration that I'd be going for. Yep. So more flexible from a production standpoint, you could get a brew a wider variety of beers yep. and use different processes. Yep. And then you'd have better control because yep. you'll, when you've nailed your conversion, you can heat your mash up to mash out temperature. You can also yep. run your lauder ton. Uh, really well, which will get you better extract efficiency. Gets you because it's a specifically designed lauder ton. Yes, it's for that one purpose only. You can yep. get your um, you won't have any. You could be able to master your lauder tonning, so you're not pulling any chlorophenols or any of the negative mm -hmm. flavor attributes that can come out of lauder tonning if it's yep. run if it's poorly designed. <laughs> Trying yes. to be diplomatic. <laughs> uh, poly, polyphenols, not chlorophenols. Sorry, po polyphenols, yeah. Um, yes. Um, what, but so what's the negatives of that kit? I mean, it sounds good that you can make negatives is you, have more you can't do double brew without spending 14 hours in the brew house. Right, because you're using the same vessel to boil that you were mashing. Yeah, you've so got to be you fully in before you can even mash in the next, think about mashing in the next yes. one. Yes. So. Right. Okay. So great for flexibility in production, not great for pumping out lots of brews. Yes. All right. So mash, lauder, single vessel, and then second vessel is uh, kettle whirlpool. Yep. So this one um, does shorten your day somewhat because uh, mm -hmm. you've got a bunch of, say you've got a bunch of double brew tanks. You're probably looking at 10 to 12 hours to do a double brew. But you lose mm -hmm. the ability. It's a, it's a single infusion kit. You, like yes. So you cannot step mash. You cannot raise your mash temp unless you're dumping hot water in, which is a mugs game. Yeah, I would say. Um, I have seen some crazy tanks with uh, steam jackets on the mash lauder. Um, yes, which which can work okay. It's a mixing that is the challenge yes. on those vessels. Yeah, you need really well designed rakes and and paddles in your lauder tons so you can get good mixing because lauder rakes are not designed to mix mash. They're designed to, you know, cut mash for yeah, lauder. They're in. low RPMs. Um, yes, and and just the way the knives are designed is just not. I'm trying to do a knife. It looked like a fish, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they're like a zigzag, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? On one side. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. Okay, so you can do it if you're clever. If your manufacturer is clever with how to design it, but it's not preferable necessarily. No, I would just lean into single infusions and single infusion recipes, which can make some pretty cracking beers with single yeah. infusion. 
there's a lot of great breweries that have these that two vessel style mash lauder with no heating and then kettle whirlpool that are making really amazing beers. Yeah, I think the um, risk of that yeah. side of things, like if I'm looking at it from a business owner perspective, you have to have crash hot brewer. Yeah, you have a skilled brewer. Yep, so you're hitting your mash temps. And because it changes seasonally, yep. right? So if it's cold and you're not checking your grain temp and you're not checking it, you, like you're not staying on top of what it's taking to get to your strike temperatures, um, mm-hmm. then you can have beers that over attenuate, that, that under attenuate if you overshoot and overcompensate. Like it ta- there's a bit of, um, there's quite a fair bit of skill that comes into that. So. Mm-hmm. It's yes. not normally the configuration that I would recommend for for people that are just starting a brewery and they don't want to always be working on the brew house. Does that make yes. sense? Yes, but, I mean, it, it gets you throughput quickly and if you have a skilled brewer, um, and it would be a similar configuration probably to what you would be doing at home if you had a homebrew kit, right? Yeah. So... You know, if you're used to that, hitting your strike temps in that circumstance, maybe you can scale that up and get good results. Yeah. But it's when you add more stuff, it becomes a headache because everyone seems to do things a little yeah, bit Yeah, obviously differently. everybody that listens to this podcast is an absolute god of brewing and they won't have any issues. But it's the people that they're <laughs> going to employ that um, That's right, might obviously. cause them some grief. <laughs> well, my mum's not a god at brewing, but um, <laughs> she's a lovely lady. <laughs> Hi, Mum, by the way. Um, okay, well, uh, my beer's nearly out, so we should probably get through these last couple. Yeah, sure. 3V, three-vessel breweries, um, what would be a typical configuration for that? I'll, I'll, I like to see separate mash, separate lauder, and kettle whirlpool if it's under mm-hmm. 2,000 litres. Yep. Can you get away with eight, uh, 18 hex, so 1,800 litres as you're a kettle whirlpool it, combined? Um, yeah, we we had some good robust discussion about this a few months ago. The main thing with that um, is getting uh, getting a static body of work moving is yes. hard. So maybe with eighteen heck, if you oversize the pump like crazy, you could get yes. away with it. But yeah, uh, I wouldn't. Rec- I'd advise you would. It. Yeah, okay. So probably let's say 15 heck brew house is probably the top for a three yeah. vessel. Um, and so like the benefits of a kit like that, it means that you can you get the benefits of being able to do step mashing and flexibility, but also the throughput, yeah. right? So you can mash in sooner and be pumping beers through the system whilst also having the ability to do step mashing, mashing out and just controlling your mash Yeah, profile. you could probably... Like I know, I know I can, but most people would be able to get a double brew yeah. day down in in like a in, a, in an hour hours. shift. No, in 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 a, in a standard eight hour shift, maybe eight and a half if you You'd, go for lunch. Yeah, right. So you um, not everyone's as good a brewer as you. Just run the water ton hard. Uh, you got a lot of hard, baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> mash in fast, lot of yeah. fast. Transfer out of whirlpool fast. Re- reduce splashing. Reduce the splashing. So three vessel is good. They're a really good, really good configuration if you can afford the space and the money. Oh, I love them. I think to the the bees knees. Fifteen heck and under, it's probably the way to go, yep. right? I always said that if I was going to build a brew pub, it'd be a three vessel steam heated twelve heck. I think is like awesome. For brew yeah. pubs, you know, you've got you can scale that and you can pump a lot of beer out of it, um, but you can also that's just a ten heck um, for everybody else because Lockie's planning on drinking four kegs from each batch. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I'm trying to curb the drinking a little bit these days, but um, <laughs> so it's down to my four kegs. Can, my can is empty. Um, and then, okay, so let's just quickly um, go through a four vessel. Four vessels are. Great for 20 heck and above, probably not necessary for anything under that. Yeah, unless you're flexing, um, it's a yep. production format. Yeah. 
And you're probably not doing production on a 12 hat kit, not no. to the scale that would would require a four vessel brew house. Yeah, I think yeah, okay. I think that four vessels are pretty awesome to brew on, and you do get a lot of extra <clears throat> yep. efficiencies, and you are able to punch out a brew in probably about four hours if and you do have the ability to stack them up so yes you are really looking at production format yeah so if you want to pump out a lot of beer and wholesale it's four vessel is probably the way to go if you're in a brew pub and you can afford it three vessel is the way to go if you just want a little two vessel you can't afford the footprint or don't have any huge aspirations for volume then uh, two vessel mash kettle whirlpool and then a separate lauder ton is probably the best for beer uh, quality and functionality and consistency. And then if you want the best of both worlds and you don't have a lot of space or money, a two vessel that has a mash lauder and then a separate kettle whirlpool would probably be best in that circumstance. <clears throat> is that a good summary? Yep, I think so. Did we do it? I think we've done it. Yes. Go team. I nearly swore. I'm not allowed to swear. I wrote the wrote the rules of the potty. <laughs> um, okay, you have anything else that you need to share? You're off to the States, Jake, on um, Sunday. Yep. Going to CBC. Yes. Gonna, it's World Beer Cup this year as well. They only do every two years. Are oh, you really? going to the awards night or anything? Um, I think so. I booked a whole bunch of stuff quite a while ago, and we have, I haven't really had a chance to look back at it. <laughs> I tell you, it's not as exciting. When I went the first time, I went to Nashville too, actually the first CBC I went to, and um, World Beer Cup was on, and I made Luke and David, I was going with, I made them pack their suits because I was used to going to AIBAs where it's a black tie event and everyone dresses up, and I rocked up, and I, luckily I bumped into Keels from Stone and Wood during the conference, and I told him, he was like, mate, it's like boardies and thongs pretty much. No one's... Uh, <sighs> No one's wearing suits, so carried my suit all the way around America in my suitcase for no reason. So don't take your tuxedo. Ah, uh, right. I'm gonna go to Reno to the casinos, so I'll take it for that. The Reno casinos, <laughs> yeah, <true. laughs> yeah, beautiful. And you got a bucks party over there too, mate. Yeah, it's gonna be it's, good. Um, that would be epic. Um, okay, well, thanks for that, mate. I um, let me go finish up my Friday afternoon, but. Um, yeah, that's it. Episode six of the Well Brewed Podcast. Um, as always, if you have any ideas or subjects you'd like to hear or specific questions that you have, please hit us up on Facebook or Instagram at Well Brewed, which is W E W L B R E W D. There's an E missing at the end if you didn't get that. Or email us at podcast at wellbrewed.com.au. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Cheers.